and lost its babbling and rushing self in the measureless flow of contemplation in the all streams oneness of side by side in the vibrance of life and celebration. And this one has never been heard anywhere or printed, and it's one of my favorites. Again, that rhymed. It's called Life Circle. A child, growing into the kingdom of here and now, tucks away in a safe mind cubby, gentle memories of happy hours, closes tenderly the door, not knowing, and never notices the cubby wisping at the edges and fading slowly into the soft mists of forgetting. Grown up, the things of childhood laid aside, a thousand worries and concerns rubbing shoulders with a thousand risks and opportunities. The grown up strides the high roads through the busy maze of life, proving to the child within a thousand skills and interests rubbing shoulders with commitments and a thousand bright ideas. Some cataloged and filed away in a safe mind cubby to treasure in the rocky chair years. Senior citizen, a bland and saltless label for the child grown old, who sits at last in that elusive rocking chair, trying vainly to remember all those thousand bright ideas that the grown up busy years had crowded out and pushed unseeingly into a vague, uncertain future now come. And all the memory can muster are the wisping edges of a safe mind cubby, floating close in misty paleness, spilling gently the happy childhood memories tucked away so long ago. And this is one of my happy childhood memories at the piano. The lovely lilting harmonies that rolled with nimble fingered ease when mother stroked piano keys have fallen silent these long years, yet now and then my memory hears, and now and then I shed soft tears. Before I go at night to rest, my fingers stroke the keys in the quest to find forgotten tunes that blessed. As peaceful music fills the air, I lay aside my daily care with melodies that rise like prayer. I wonder if my eyes could see through curtains of eternity, would mother hear my melody? And hearing, would she smile at me? This one I call Alma's song. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I made my daughter cry. <laughs> yeah. This one is Alma's song, and all the grandchildren call me Alma. The gifts of love from childhood's hands, with crooked lines and words misspelled, become the treasures of old age with poignant memories long indwelt. And sometimes, on a winter day, she hums a long forgotten tune, unpacks her useless bed and board, and basks in yellow afternoon. <laughs> and I think I will finish on one called slumber time. As embers glowing brilliant red turn dull, <coughs> then black, then ash gray white, and lie in cooling stillness there upon the hearthstone late at night. So all my glowing daytime thoughts turn softly still and lose their spark. My mind fills up and goes to sleep, cradled in gentle velvet.
second row here is Antoinette D'Angelo, who writes some of the most beautiful poetry I've heard. <laughs> and I'm embarrassing her, I know. <laughs> but she has delighted me with her poetry many times. And there's my daughter, who once wrote a very lovely poem in school and brought it home. And we worked on it together, changed a couple words so the rhyme and word rhythm were fine, and we set it to music. Lynn, would you like to come up here and sing it with me? Spring <laughs> 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 is here, spring is here, sunny, happy time of year, melting snow and mud and showers, robin songs and bright new flowers. Tender green creeps up the lawn. Ice is nice, but I'm glad it's gone. <laughs> children treasure and I think it should be put right there along with the night before Christmas. It was the night after Christmas and all over the floor were wrappings and ribbons and boxes galore. The chairs were all cluttered, the place was a sight. Old Santa would faint if he saw it tonight. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of morning disturbed their foreheads. The place must be straightened and things put away. It was worth all the fun they had Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of the stories of that collection, but this is based on a true. This is based on a true story, although I've changed the names around, and I hope uh, it happened so long ago that I don't think anybody will get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the G and W General Store was just that. It carried generally just about everything. If Ben did not have it in stock, he would get it for you on the next train. It was a fascinating place for Leo. Now, Leo was the boy that I was trying to work through this thing, and he appears in some of these, uh, but uh, he's fast growing up and probably going to go away to school or something and won't be involved with these anymore. <laughs> he was not allowed to go to the store alone, but when his mother allowed it, he jumped at the chance to make the visit. The shelves and counters are always filled with fantastic assortment of groceries, hardware, dry goods, shoes, harness materials, and so forth. The smells were sheer delight. Coffee, spices, leather, and more. In one corner of the store was the United States Post Office. Facing outward was a window protected with iron bars and shuttered with a cake sliding glass. On either side were a hundred small glass windows revealing the interior of a hundred small cubicles uh, directly behind. When a patron wanted his mail, he looked to see if there was anything in his box and asked the postmaster for it. If he couldn't afford a box, he didn't even have to look. All he had to do was ask. Ben was the official postmaster, with D helping whenever necessary. Although there were official post office hours, with the window opening up at 8 a.m. and closing at 5 a.m. If you had mail and wanted to get it, all you had to do was ask, and someone would go behind the window and pick yours out of his cubicle. Bill Denton worked most of his life at the store. He was energetic, quick to learn. Ben came to depend upon him, although he never gave Bill his due. The mail came in each day but Sunday by train, four times a day, two north, Two southbound mail trains dropped off bags of mail and packages. 
Four times a day, the station master delivered the United States mail to the Glenfield Post Office. And four times a day, it was sorted by the G&W Company. Very shortly after he started working for the G&W Company, Bill began to work in the post office. He sorted mail, made out money orders, sold stamps, weighed the parcel posts, and just about everything but signed the monthly reports. He was good-natured, energetic, and accommodating. Ben was satisfied with his work, and the townspeople liked him. Maud Peace lived on Main Street. She was an attractive, large-boned young woman. After she graduated from high school, she got work at the local box factory, continuing to live with her parents. Each afternoon, on her way home from work, she would stop at the post office <clears throat> to get the family's mail. They didn't often get mail, but the box rent was small, and they felt it was a, an important, prestigious thing. So, number 87 had been in the, in the family box for years. And he mailed for peace, was the way Bill was introduced to Maude. He was behind the window, but it was after the fire and the window was closed. He took the contents from 87, opened the window, handed them to Maude, and was instantly smitten. After that, he managed six days a week to be near the post office in the corner to be able to be at Maud's service. The town of Glenfield did not have many socializing events, but to whatever was offered, Bill managed to take Maud. Summer picnics, winter card parties, Saturday night dances were the staple fare. Maud liked his company and Bill was persistent. And soon they came to be recognized as a couple by the townspeople, that is, until Wade Murphy came on the scene. Actually, Wade lived off and on in town and had for years. He was a good lumberjack, reliable, and innovative. He was soon given overseeing jobs, bossing crews of lumberjacks. As a result of this, he was frequently out of town working for jobbers around the Adirondacks. One spring, after the log drives were over, he came back to town and began to look seriously at Maud. Wade was not the usual lumberjack type. Most of the lumberjacks came to town to buy some new work clothes, work boots, and drink. When the money was gone, they returned to the woods. Wade was different. He managed to save most of his money. But he was also a wanderer. He had worked in Maine, Vermont, and Canada. Each winter, it seemed, he worked for a different job in a different part of the country. <coughs> Wade was a big man, always clean, well-shaven, and neatly dressed. His language was acceptable, although on occasion he could use profanity with a serious proficiency. <laughs> Tall, big-shouldered, with large hands, he was just the opposite of Bill. While Bill was energetic, he was also quiet. Not so Wade. Wade was loud and booming. His hearty laugh could be heard halfway down the street. Maud liked Wade. So Bill had to share Maud all that summer, and he didn't like it. Physically, Maud and Wade were a better match. While Maud was not much larger than Bill, she seemed that way, especially when Wade was in the vicinity. Bill was aware of this. He was also aware that many of the townspeople now thought Maud would end up with Wade. When fall arrived, Wade took a job on the other side of the Adirondacks near Lake George. His sidekick, Grover Swan, went with him as usual, and the two had been working together for several years. Maud was not too happy about the leaving, but she was still had Bill for company, and during the winter months, during the winter months, and Wade had promised faithfully to write. Bill was happy about the arrangement. He was going to make the best use of the several winter months without any direct competition. Each day Maud called at the post office for her mail looking eagerly for Wade's first letter. As the weeks merged into months with no letter, she stopped writing to him. Bill was her ever-ready escort. There wasn't a card party or dance that they didn't attend together. The townspeople again began to think of them as a couple, and so did Ma. <clears throat> it was at a sugar on snow party in late March, in the basement of the Methodist church, that Bill popped the question. 
Each year is a social event and a fundraiser. The ladies of the Methodist Church put on a sugar on snow party. The sugaring season had about come to an end. Most of the farms near Glenfield made maple syrup, so donations of maple sugar were easy, were easy to come by. The syrup was boiled down further until it reached the candy stage, and then it was poured on pans of clean, white snow. The amber sweet congealed on the snow into a sticky state, which was then forked into either eager mouths. For 10 cents a pan, you could get all the sweet you needed for a week. Bill waited until Maude had her mouth full and jaws stuck together before asking the question. <laughs> Unable to speak at the moment, Maude looked at Bill and nodded yes. A few days earlier, Grover Swan had returned to Greenville, to Glenfield, and announced that he and Wade Murphy we're going to Oregon for Big Tree Lumber. Perhaps this had some bearing on Maud's answer. It was about two years later that the first son was born. Bill was more in love than ever and much more sure of himself as he confessed to Maud that he had intercepted Waite's letters as he sorted the mail. <laughs> Six envelopes he had stuffed in his pocket and burned at night at home. Maud's reaction was not what Bill expected. She laughed and laughed. Grover Swan, on his last visit before the Oregon journey, had told her that Waite had received her letters and had written regularly. I put two and two together and knew that you were doing that all along, she said. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have anything more? No. I've got one more story if you'd like to hear it. Yes. Sure. sure. This is one of those stories, but it's been totally rewritten to move it inside of the blue line. And uh, I've submitted this to the uh, uh, editor of Adirondack Life. He said he wanted to look at it, and so I, I sent it to him. I, I don't know whether he'll take it or not, but I, I hope so. Uh, this is entitled, The Black River Adirondack, the Adirondack Black River Valley World Series. During the depths of the Great Depression, rest and recreation were not a high priority item. People in Lewis County worked hard, <coughs> rested little, and recreated only when it involved little or no money. During the 30s, homegrown grass baseball was the major summer recreational item for a large number of players and fans in the Black River Valley and environs. By the middle of August, it became apparent <coughs> that the Brandingham Spikehorns and the Glenfield Red Sox would be the only contenders for the Adirondack Black River Valley Championship. So, on the last Sunday before Labor Day, each team in possession of one game in the two out of three game playoff. The luck of the draw gave Brandingham the home field advantage. Their field was located across the road from the Methodist Church. James Mellon Bellows was a pastor of the two-point charge that consisted of the communities of Brandingham Lake and Gray. Occasionally, he lived up to his name and thundered from the pulpit. He was very much against baseball. But since the summer people came from the lake, from the lake and made up most of his congregation, as well as much of the baseball crowd, he compromised and decided in favor of economics. In religious circles during Depression, economics had a mighty high priority with an equally low return. Brandingham Lake is on the western side of the Adirondacks. From before the turn of the century, it boasted two fine hotels, Brandingham Lake Inn and Long Point Inn. The registers of these hotels displayed addresses from the far away of Chicago and New York City. For most of these summer people in the early 30s, the Depression had not yet become a great problem. These people usually came by train to Glenfield via the New York Central. Then they were transported by wood panel station wagon across the Black River, over to Greg, up Pickerel Hill to the resort area. 
Scattered around the lake was a large number of cottages to which families came after school let out. Most of these stayed until Labor Day. The Glenfield Red Sox were in contention <coughs> mainly because of their pitching. Nine yards fouled. Yards, for short, was a six foot six farmer who had an incredible fastball and more than considerable accuracy. In his youth, he had thrown pebbles gathered from Otter Creek and a wooden sap bucket behind the barn. Years of practice had developed the muscles and control that enabled him to throw strikes with abandon. Around the village, he was recognized as having the whole nine yards when it came to pitching. The Brandingham spike horns always had some ringers, which made them a perennial threat. Each summer, college kids came to work in the hotels. The hotels tried to hire those that played college baseball, so as to augment the spike horn roster. This year, there were three. Two from Brandingham Lake Inn and one from Long Point and they made for a pretty tight entry. Each player provided his own equipment. Only the college kids had spikes. The rest of the players wore whatever shoes, sneakers, they could muster. Yards pitched wearing a heavy pair of leather boots. Each team wore the same colored baseball caps. Otherwise, the uniforms were determined by economics and artistic bent. <laughs> Lee Fish, blacksmith in Glenfield, was also a good woodworker. For 10 to 15 cents, he would turn out a ball bat to your specifications, if you supplied the wood. Most players cut bolts of white ash in the nearby woods and had Lee turn out one or two large diameter bats, which they finished off with boiled linseed oil. The big problem was baseball. The League Board of Governors Governors required that each team provide six balls for each home game. These were expensive. Since no charge would make for the games, although a collection was taken up to pay the umpires, money was pretty scarce. Seldom were new balls infused into the rotation, so by the end of the season, the balls were in pretty bad shape. The board also established ground rules, which were mostly that there were no ground rules. <laughs> However, since the Brandingham Diamond was surrounded by thick Adirondack woods and decorated with some lush void and ivy, it had one ground rule that any fair ball hit into the woods would go as a two-base hit. Nine yards about was a terrible. Usually had to pitch only nine balls an inning for the first two or three innings. Bill Krause was his catcher. Bill, in addition to using an extra thick sponge inside his catcher's mitt, had loosened the leather in the pocket so that when one of Yard's pitches streaked in, it made an extra loud, booming splat. This deadly booming helped to intimidate the batters. <laughs> because he had learned to throw only without a creek, Pebbles, Yards had never developed anything but a fastball. <clears throat> he and Bill used three signs, high, low, and medium. <laughs> medium meant split his navel. <laughs> so now we come to the last part of this last game. It is the last half of the 13th inning. The sun hangs low in the gathering clouds over Tug Hill to the west. The score has been tied at three all, since the seventh. The spikes are at bat. Somehow, the college kid shortstop got on second. There are two outs, and Ron <coughs> Greylock, Greylock is at bat. Now Ron, partly Mohawk, was one of the smarter spikes. In winter, he worked as a lumberjack in the woods around Brandon. In the summer, he did maintenance for the hotels and cottages. He had had Lee Fish turn in two bats, one with a very large diameter for what he called the normal pitchers, and one much slimmer to use against yards. He reasoned that he could swing the smaller, lighter bat faster and thus maybe help even up the odds against yards. Against yards, incredibly fast ball. 
Ron had been to bat four times. He had hit a couple of foul balls and a looper to center short. For 12 innings, he had been studying yards. <clears throat> he was aware now that all of the pitches were coming in belly button high and that yards was tiring. After all, yards had been blasting balls across the plate for over 12 innings. Because yard was tiring, Bill had been sending just the medium signal since the 11th inning, which in this case meant just put it over the strike zone. The Board of Governors, in its wisdom, had required two officials for the playoff. Satch, Singletree, a man of considerable stature in the league, was behind the plate. Maynard Fleet, who had once tried out with the Utica Semi-Pro team, took care of the infield and its environment. Now remember, there were two outs with a winning run on second when Ron, with his slim bat, stepped into the batter's box. Yards wound up. His hands were so big that they covered the ball completely. To most batters, that made the ball seem about as big as a ping pong ball and that much harder to hit. Because of his long legs and extra long arms, Yards seemed to be right in front of the batter's face when he finished the pitch. <laughs> While these things, plus the thunder of the resonating catcher's mitt, intimidated most batters, Ron was not impressed. As the first pitch steamed in, belly button high, Ron stepped into it and swung his slim bat as hard as he could. When a baseball and the good wood of a bat come together, there is a very loud and satisfying crack. Even the most uninitiated baseball fan recognizes this hallmark sound. As Ron's bat connected with Yard's pitch, there was a loud sound, but it was more of a thump than a crack. The center fielder immediately started batting, sensing it was going to be a long ball. The runner on second streak for third. The ball started out fast and arched high above second base. Suddenly, it wobbled and stopped rising. The second baseman backed up and waved off the shortstop. The runner rounded third and steamed for home. The ball, battered by eight weeks of play, gave up the ghost. <laughs> its cover came off and fluttered down. <laughs> the twine rabbit core dropped like a stone, trailing along the way. Pedaling backward, the second baseman caught the twine covered ball core. The ragged cover fluttered towards center, chased by the shortstop. He managed to shove his glove under it just before it touched the ground. <laughs> In triumph, he held up the tattered pieces of leather. Even though it took two men, the ball had been caught, making the Red Sox jubilant. The runner had crossed home, and Ron was ensconced on first, making the spike horns jubilant. The crowd became dead quiet. Then both teams charged onto the field. He's out. He's saved. Two men can't catch one ball. The ball was caught, no matter how many men caught it. <laughs> Satch waved Maynard in and they went into a huddle, surrounded by the teams which were surrounded by the fans. <coughs> a din generated in mushroom. Finally, Satch raised his hands and the crowd cried. <coughs> Maynard and I are going to go and sit in my truck, he announced. We have a rule book, and we'll sort this thing out. Now stay away from the truck and let us work. <laughs> Satch was highly respected, and his words were command. The crowd watched from a distance, as the two poured over the rule book. They talked back and forth with a lot of headship. Finally, they nodded in resigned agreement and returned to the ball field. The sun had disappeared behind the vast Tug Hill, Tug Hill Plateau. The crowd was deadly quiet as Satch started to speak. The rule book is pretty murky on the map. <laughs> it does not throw much light on the subject of disintegrating baseball. <laughs> it is quite possible that the spike horn hit would have gone into the woods for a ground rule double and the run scored would count, winning the game. However, since the home team has to supply the balls 
and they supply the defective ball, the onus is on them. Satch was a great reader. And thus